So once again, my name is Martha Burtis. I work here at the PSU Open Learning and Teaching Collaborative. And this session is um, for some folks here on campus who are interested in learning more about the social networking uh, microblogging system Mastodon, in particular because of um, all of the drama that's happened in the last couple of months at Twitter. Some of us who've made a home on Twitter for many, many years are now exploring alternatives. So I'm going to be kind of taking you through um, the 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 ins and outs of Mastodon. I want to start this with this disclaimer, which is that I'm just figuring this stuff all out too. So um, I've been on Mastodon for about a hot minute. Um, I'm still not convinced that it's where I'm going to spend the majority of my time, or as much time as I used to spend on Twitter. Um, but I think it's there's a lot to be explored here. There's some interesting possibilities. And I think as people are deciding what to do, um, it's one platform that's worth spending some time looking at. Um, I also will say just before I get started that this workshop um, is really gonna be a little bit more of a presentation for the large portion of it because there's a lot of information. Um, there's a lot more text on these slides than I usually use, and that's because I would forget all of this information if I tried to rely on my memory um, to recall it, because there's a lot of information. And I wanted to get this recorded in one place, give people an opportunity to learn these details. Hopefully, though, by the end, we will have a chance, a few minutes for people who want to um, either ask questions or start exploring and trying stuff out to do that today. And then the other thing I will just say before getting started is that I really did focus on what I'm doing here on Mastodon. So I'm assuming that you have a little bit of a familiarity and experience with Twitter. Some of what I'm going to be talking about is talking about Mastodon in comparison to Twitter um, or juxtaposed to Twitter. And um, if you haven't used Twitter much, some of that may not make as much sense, but I think you'll still be able to learn a lot about this particular platform. So before the first question that I was just wanted to throw up here, it's been on the top of my mind as I've been deciding what to do about Twitter is to start thinking about what is, what is it that I should be caring about as I look at other platforms, as I look at other systems, what actually matters to me um, and what should I be examining? And the first thing that I have up here is this question of abuse and hate speech versus freedom of speech, which is, you know, we could do a, an entire um, series of presentations just about that first um, point in the list. And so I don't want to, you know, get too bogged down in it at this moment. But definitely for me, um, I had a lot, a lot of the reasons why I'm thinking that I need to get off of Twitter is that there's been a huge rise in the last few weeks on Twitter. Um, the data is already showing in terms of hate speech, racism, homophobic um, speech, um, sexism, Nazi, fascist speech, um, all of which for me is, even if it's not right in my face because I'm careful about who I interact with, I'm not really comfortable seeing that growing out of control in the ecosystem around me. So I'm interested in looking at platforms that are at the very least caring about these issues and talking about how they're going to address these issues. And related to that really has to do with how platforms are approaching moderation and the moderation of content. Um, the second thing that's important to me is transparency. And what does that mean? That's transparency about, um, about administration, about who's running the system, who's in charge. It's transparency about moderation, about how decisions are getting made, about what is put in front of people and what isn't put in front of people. And it's also transparency about funding, about how the, um, the tool or the platform is being sustained um, because there's a cost involved in running these systems. And finally, the thing that I care about is ownership, and that's both um, ownership of my content and my data. That should say data, not date. Um, ownership of my content or my data in the system. So am I giving up any rights to it? Um, or do I maintain um, my full rights over my content? And if I decide to move off of the platform, can I get my content and my data out of it? as well as ownership of infrastructure. So um, where is this system, the technology of this system being owned? Who, who owns it? This gets back to questions about administration as well. So Mastodon is by no means the only option out there. I wanted to throw a couple up here. 
for those of you who are still exploring, this is not an exhaustive list, but it is a few that you might be um, also interested in taking a look at. So Mastodon, which is what we're going to be talking about primarily today, is an open source um, platform. It's been around for, I think, six or seven years, but it really hasn't gained tremendous popularity until probably the last few years, and in particular, the last year with the announcement of um, Elon Musk buying Twitter. Um, it is a federated system. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. It was created by um, one guy, a programmer named Eugene Gargren. Um, he does collaborate with others at this point, but he really is the owner of the system. He maintains that identity as being the owner of the system. Some other options that you might want to explore, Counter Social, which is um, owned by the Jester. And I feel like I'm now like in a Marvel comic um, or I don't know, is the jo is the, jo the Joker Marvel or um, or the other universe? I can't remember. But anyway, it is literally owned by somebody who goes by the name of the Jester. He's a, a massively well-known hacker who's been around for about a decade. Um, and he started Counter Social, basing it on Mastodon a while back. Um, it is not, um, it's not the federated uh, model so much as it is a single instance called Counter Social. It it is takes a very heavy, heavy-handed, or I should say like um a clear and strict approach to certain moderation, um, including the outright blocking of content from certain countries. Um, it has be been one of the platforms that people have been looking at as an alternative to Twitter. It definitely, um, at least the talks the talk of wanting to um, protect, protect speech, but also keep um, the space safe. Um, for for people who are participating. Um, another one that has been talked about in the last couple of weeks is one called Post. This is still in beta. Um, it was ac it's actually created by the the CEO of Waze, the like app on your phone that lets you look at traffic and accidents. Um, it's committed to robust moderation is what they're saying. Um, early access is um, only uh, it's it's still in beta so you have to request access. Um, you can get bumped up in that list through referrals. So if you would like to um, go through this link, I will get a referral from you, but you don't have to do that if you want to use Post. One of the things that a little bit of critique about Post is that um, they are, they've been very upfront about the fact that they're not getting bogged down in things like accessibility. Um, they're just trying to get this up and running and they'll deal with all of those other issues later. Um, and so, you know, some folks feel like that is a little bit problematic because if you're not building a system that's welcoming to all people, then you're not going to have those people involved in helping set the course and direction of that system because they're going to be um, invisible to the system. So it's just kind of a caveat to think about. This one I just heard about today and it has that emoji next to it because narwhals are my favorite animal in the whole world. Um, it's called the Narwhal Project. It's in beta. We don't know anything about it other than that it's owned by the CEO of the Atlantic. So stay tuned for the Narwhal Project. Um, and then Hive Social is another one not to be confused with a completely different platform form called Hive. Um, Hive Social is basically a Twitter clone. Um, and it's been experiencing some growing pains, as a lot of these platforms have with the um, implosion of Twitter. Um, but if you really, really, what you're really looking for is like, I just want Twitter back. Um, that may be your best bet, but it may be hard to get an account right now because they've been having to put stuff on hold. I think there's like two guys who run it. So it's like Twitter back in the olden days. Um, but the biggest name in the Twitter replacement game right now is Mastodon. It's what's getting the most attention. And, um, let me just talk a little bit about how it is sort of the same as Twitter. So things that we know from Twitter, we know about timelines of posts, we know hashtags, likes and retweets, the entire verification game, which has been you know, in the news the last couple of months. It used to be that to get verified, you had to prove you were actually the person who you said you were. It was reserved mostly for people with some kind of celebrity or newsworthiness to their identity. Elon Musk decided he would just charge people somewhere between eight and twenty dollars a month, and they could get verified. That didn't work so well, so it's all it's all up in the air at this point at Twitter. Um, and then, of course, um, the ability in Twitter to send DMs. So those are kind of like basic standard features of Twitter that we've all come to know and understand over the years. It's worth mentioning. Um, I'm I've been on 
Twitter since 2007. Um, and not all of these things existed when Twitter first emerged. Hashtags, for example, were not built into Twitter. They emerged out of the use of the community. Um, so while these are things that we know and love, maybe, <laughs> maybe don't always love, but we know and we're familiar with on Twitter, it's it, these these platforms are um, very often um, evolve over time. So what we're seeing a mastodon now, it's very likely that there will be changes over time um, as the community um, grows and new needs emerge. So how does this these features compare on Mastodon? Mastodon also has timelines, timelines of posts. The biggest difference is there's no algorithm. Um, Twitter at this point was using some pretty heavy handed algorithms to decide what showed up in your timeline. So, you know, when, when Twitter was first born, um, it was just reverse chronological, the latest stuff um, over time as as they sought advertising model for revenue. Um, they instituted algorithms that tried to make sure you were seeing the stuff that they thought you wanted to see. Um, Mastodon is pure chronology. You just see the latest stuff. That's it. Um, there, are, there are actually, it's not really four versions of the timeline, really three versions of the timeline. I'll talk about those in a second. Um, they do use hashtags on Mastodon. And in fact, they are the only way to search content in Mastodon. Um, there's no full text search um, of content in Mastodon, and that is deliberate. It is to prevent abuse so that um, it's harder for people to kind of stalk your content on Mastodon based on words you use or phrases you use. You have to deliberately choose to use a hashtag in order for people to, people to be able to find something that you posted. There are favorites on Mastodon, which are a little bit like likes, but they're kind of public, kind of not. Um, what you don't see in Mastodon, what we've gotten used to see on Twitter is on posts, it'll show you how many likes and how many retweets will be right there under the post. Mastodon doesn't do that. Again, that's deliberate. They're trying to get away from the kind of popularity model of social content um, and, and diffuse that dynamic a little bit. Um, there are also something called bookmarks, which are not public. Those are just visible to you. When you favorite a post, it is possible for the person who wrote that post to see you favorited it. Um, in, and in some platforms, you, if you go to a post, not on the timeline, but you dig down to look at a post, you might be able to see how many favorites there are. But again, it's very much kind of on the back. You have to you have to look for it. It's not front and center. Um, there aren't retweets on Mastodon. Instead, there's something called boosts. Um, and when you boost a post, it um, will show it to people who you're following. It also um, lets the original owner know you boosted it. But again, it doesn't keep track of how many boosts a post has got, a posting has gotten. And significantly, there are no quote tweets. So what you cannot do, which you were able to do on Twitter, is sort of um, take somebody else's um, posting and write something above it and send it out as your own. Um, Mastodon sees that as hijacking the conversation. Um, so again, that's a deliberate choice in Mastodon to not allow users to quote, um, quote tweet. There is verification in Mastodon, but it is very different. Um, the only verification you can do is um, in your profile, you can link to your website if you own your own website, and you can put some um, HTML code on that site that Mastodon will notice and verify that that website belongs to you. So it's a way for you to point to a site um, that you have ownership of where you might have more verifiable information about who you are. Um, and finally, um, in terms of DMs, there are visibility choices. When you post on Mastodon, you can make something public, you can make it unlisted, you can only share it with followers, or you can make it direct or private. However, and this is really important, when you make something direct or private or just for your followers, it doesn't go into some separate place or some separate folder for you to keep track of. It just shows up in your timeline like any other posting. So it's easy to get confused. <laughs> So it's not necessarily the best place to be having private conversations. One could argue that Twitter wasn't either though. So, um, so those are some ways in which they're kind of the same, sort of the same. Here are some ways in which Mastodon is totally different from Twitter. Um, this is the most important one. Mastodon operates on what's called a federated model. Um, so it's kind of like email servers where each um, instance of Mastodon has its own rules, its own administrator and its own address. Um, they all run on the same software, but they they have different um, servers or instances that you that you have to and you have to join one of those when you um, get signed up on Mastodon. I'll talk about more about that in a minute. 
There are no ads on Mastodon. Um, the brands can join. So like companies, corporations can join Mastodon just like anyone else, but they're just users. They can't buy ad space. Um, there is a 500 character limit instead of a 200 and what is it? No, 140. Um, so you have a little bit more space. Some people feel like that allows for more um, quality conversation to happen in Mastodon. And then this one is a really important one. Content warnings are built into Mastodon. It's really easy to flag a post as having a content warning. If you're talking about a subject that might be sensitive, people also very frequently use them, use them just for practical reasons as what we call headline folds. So that if you're writing a really long posting in Mastodon, instead of it taking up a lot of space in someone's timeline, you can have a headline. People have to click to open it up and see the rest. Um, you can edit posts in Mastodon and it will keep track of the history of those edited posts. Um, and it will let someone else know, like if somebody boosted a post and you edited it, edited it, it will let that person know it has been edited so that they can unboost it if they don't like that edit. Um, there are no counts visible on timelines. I already talked about that. It is migration friendly. And I'll talk about that in a, in a minute. Um, and again, just to reiterate, no quote tweets, no full text search. Um, that right there, those two things are probably the most significant differences between um, Mastodon and Twitter. So let's talk a little bit about this federation model and what that means. What we see here on the left is a centralized model. This is Twitter, right? So in the center is that big corporation Twitter. They own the servers, they own the software, they own the, the, the infrastructure, they make all the decisions, they make the policies and everything else um, is, is related back to that. Um, on the far right, you have what's called a distributed model. I'm not gonna really get into that. It was just part of this graphic. But in the middle, you have what we call a federated model. And so you have these little clusters um, and clusters can be um, related to each other or clusters can be completely isolated from each other. And that's the, the federated model that Twitter, uh, that Mastodon uses. So um, to put that into some more, maybe some more clear terminology, a Mastodon website. website. So you'll see people refer to um, a, it as a Mastodon website, a Mastodon instance, or a Mastodon server. Those are all basically interchangeable. A Mastodon website can operate alone, um, just like a traditional website. People can sign up on it. People can post messages, upload pictures, talk to each other. But unlike a regular old website, Mastodon websites, because they're running on the same platform, the same software can interoperate, allowing users, users to communicate across instances, servers, websites with each other within the Mastodon universe. A little bit more on instances and federations. So again, Mastodon website is the same as a Mastodon instance, is the same as a Mastodon server. That can be, feel a little confusing. You just need to know that those words are interchangeable. You do have to choose one when you first start. And for some people, this is like this decision feels like paralyzing, and then they just don't go any further um, because it's not, it's not, it's not necessarily transparent or intuitive. Um, you also, I should mention as a side note, can start your own instance. Anybody who has the technical know-how and, and access to the technical infrastructure needed can um can spin up their own Mastodon instance. It's open source software, it's free, it's readily downloadable. There's lots of support documentation and communities out there that will help people get started with this. Some people will um, roll out their own instance and they are the only user on that instance. So it's a little bit like running your own email server or account. You can connect with other Mastodon um, instances and servers, but you're not letting anybody else on yours, it's just you. There are some advantages and disadvantages to that. Within each instance, um, whoever is administering it gets to set their own rules about things like what, what's acceptable content, how is content gonna be moderated, how are we gonna fund this project? Because again, there is a cost involved in doing any sort of, um, um, uh, administering any kind of project like this on the web. Um, and then all instances that are listed, the main website for Mastodon is join Mastodon, where you would go to find an instance is joinmastodon.org. Any instance that's listed there has to have agreed to what's called the Mastodon Server Covenant. And I'm just gonna click on that a second so we can look at it together. Um, 
So all of the Mastodon server covenant servers have to agree to um, actively moderate against racism, sexism, transphobia, and homophobia. They have to agree to be doing daily backups, at least once a day backups. They have to have at least one other person with emergency access to the server infrastructure, so it can't just be a single person. And they have to commit to give their users at least three months of advance warning in case of shutting down. So those are just some basic rules that everybody has to agree to um, in order to get listed at Join Mastodon. If you go to Join Mastodon, there are, there are servers listed there, but it's by no means a comprehensive list of all of the Mastodon servers. It's a very small sub subsection of people who have agreed to the covenant and then submitted their instance to that large, um, that to that directory. Um, a few weeks ago, when things really, really were kind of uh, falling apart at Twitter, so many people were flooding uh, Mastodon instances that many of the instances had locked down registration. You couldn't Usually they had open registration, they had to turn that off and you had to um, get waitlisted or you just had to wait until they reopened. Um, that's getting a little bit better. Um, a lot of them are kind of ramping up to meet the demand. Um, so if you go there, you might find a server that you want to join. I will also say though, some of them, you, you might look at that directory and be like, this is such a bizarre hodgepodge of topics and interests where are the rest of them? Um, and and there, for that, you really have to do a little bit of exploring, talking to people, see, ask people who you know what server or instance they're using. Um, and then just like kind of as a technical side note, underneath all of this, underneath Mastodon, is this protocol called ActivityPub um, that facil facilitates federation, the federation of services across um, servers. Um, and it, um, Activity Pub is not exclusive to Mastodon. It actually can be used to um, connect to what is now known as the Fediverse. Um, it, it it can be from lots of different um, applications and spaces. So Pixel Fed, for example, I set up an account for myself there, is kind of like a federated version of Instagram. Um, so an image sharing service with kind of similar features to Instagram, except that it's part of the Fediverse, it uses ActivityPub. And so I can um, find, like within Mastodon, I can follow my Pixel Fed user account from within Mastodon and vice versa. So we're starting to see more and more services begin to try and become part of this um, federated universe. Um, because it makes it, it facilitates the easy sharing of our content across lots of different kinds of spaces. So I was also able to, for example, um, activate Activity Pub on my blog and create essentially like a federated hub for from my blog as well. So when you're choosing an instance, what sort of things do you need to consider? Um, most instances have some sort of central topic or theme, and they can be super specific or, or general. Um, you'll find lots of them that are kind of local theme, like people who live in this city in the Netherlands. <laughs> you'll also find ones that are like interest themed. So it might be around a particular kind of technology or a particular um, field or discipline that people are working in. Um, so finding one that kind of aligns with what your interests are and what your values are, that's how some people pick, um, pick their instance. Who's running it? So you should do a little research looking around on the instance about the, the information that they've shared about who's in charge. Um, what are the rules that you have to follow when you're on that server? Um, are they using the covenant? Are they using something similar to guide um, participation on that instance? Are you in agreement with those rules? Um, do they follow the covenant? That's a good way of just kind of knowing where that where things um, fall with a particular server. And then there's the question of how many people are on it. So I'm currently, the main instance that I've been participating in is the original Mastodon um, instance called mastodon.social. It's run by the guy who owns Mastodon, the creator of Mastodon. It's really, really big. Um, there are some advantages to that. Um, there are some disadvantages to that. Uh, if I go and look at the timeline from my server, it's like drinking from a fire hose. Um, it's and there's you know it's like hundred that hundreds of thousands of people I don't know or care about. Um, but at the same time, it's easier to search across it. There's a lot of depth to it. 
I might find new people and new stuff that way. It's a little bit more like Twitter was or Twitter even is if you just go to the main Twitter public timeline. Um, but one important thing to know is that you can easily move instances. So if you start on an instance and you decide this isn't really where I want to make my home, it is incredibly easy to move yourself to another instance and essentially um, Mastodon will auto automatically connect those two so that people can find you. So you won't get lost to people who were already following you. You can also have multiple accounts on different instances. I discovered last week that I had thought I had set up a Mastodon account like earlier this year, but I couldn't find it anywhere. And then a friend of mine found it and was like, oh, you also have an account at um, a, an instance called scholar.social that I hadn't been using. Um, so you can have multiple accounts. Um, some people may do that because they're using different accounts for different things. Um, but that's also a possibility. When you're in Mastodon, just like in Twitter, you have a timeline which allows you to see activity. Um, there's basically three primary timelines. One is your home timeline, which is basically everyone you follow. Then one is your local timeline, which is public posts of users who are on your server, right? So if I go to the local timeline for mastodon.social, I'm gonna see all of the posts um, from anybody who is on the mastodon.social server, which is huge. And then there's what's called the federated timeline, which is public posts of anybody on my instance, as well as those that they follow. So you can see how it gets really big at that point. Um, if you're already on a big server, that gets exponentially larger, right? A hand is raised. Who has a question? I have a question. It's Robin. Can you hear me? I can. Okay. My question, and, they, and if you don't know the answer, that's fine. But I'm curious about like, I know that sometimes um, an instance, actually fairly often, will block yeah. a whole other server, right? Yes. Because they're Nazis or whatever. Yeah. And that's yes. that's great. I like that because I trust my moderators. Yeah. Um, so I understand that some are blocked. But in order to get into my federated timeline, does my instance have to do something to follow those other instances or are they automatically following anybody on Mastodon until they're blocked? So my understanding is that yeah. your federated timeline is gonna be the public posts of users on your instance plus the people they follow unless they are following somebody who is blocked by your instance um, or is on a server that is blocked by your instance. Does that make sense? On my instance and those they follow. So the federated timeline then is only people or accounts that people in my instance follow. Well, it's also the people in your instance. So it's the people in your instance and the ones they follow. So if you, I see. Ten, I, yeah, I thought the federated timeline was more of a fire hose of just like all the stuff in the federation, but that would be, I guess, Posturously large. I don't know. Yeah. I, but I this is still really large when you think of it because if you have an instance of say a thousand people and each of them follow a thousand people, you're going to see a thousand times a thousand people in the federated timeline. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I thought though, like so for example, I got off scholar, which I honestly really did not like at all, but I would like to see all the scholar posts right but so i kind of thought i would get those somewhere but i i'm not I'm my not understanding guessing. is you're not that in order yeah. to see all the scholar posts you would have to have an account on scholar yeah, I think but right. i will right. refer back to my original disclaimer which is that i am figuring this all out and it's yeah. a little complicated well no i'm i'm um, glad you just like honestly haven't really thought about what was in there so you know even this is very very helpful thank you can you but follow I, who's in another instance? Yes. Yes, you can. Absolutely. The only and reason you magic, yeah. right? It's like Martha said, it's like email. I can email you, whether you're Gmail or Plymouth.edu. So that's the whole point of federation is that even if someone's somewhere else, you can follow them. Right. Okay. But finding but, them is a little harder because like Martha's saying, you're not seeing them unless there's some relationship. Right. So at the beginning, it can be a little harder to find the people. But you raise a really good, 
point two, Robin, which I hadn't talked about yet, and I can't even remember if I have something in here specifically about this, but servers can make decisions to block other servers um, to what's called defederate them and uh, isolate them essentially if they don't agree with their rules, if they don't agree with their policies, if there's something toxic going on there that they don't want to be a part of. My understanding is if you are on a server and you try to follow somebody on a blocked server, you're not going to be able to do that from that account because they do your the people on your server don't want to see that stuff. So if you want to see that stuff, you're going to have to find another way to see it. All right. So those are the three different timelines. The fourth one, which I didn't really put up here because it's not so much a timeline in the same way, is that you can get a, a, a listing of your notifications, which are basically like anytime somebody responds to a posting you wrote or boosts a posting you wrote or um, likes a posting you wrote. So that's kind of similar to Twitter as well. Um, so then in terms of interacting with Mastodon, there's two kind of primary ways of doing it similar to Twitter. You can just use the Mastodon instance or website that you are a part of to interact. So you can just go to your browser and for me, go to Mastodon social, go to whichever instance you're a part of, um, and you can, you can participate and see the activity there. But if you prefer to use an app, um, there are some options. I will say most of the options are designed for um, mobile devices. So the official Mastodon client, for example, is available for the i like the um, like iPhone and Android like devices. It's not an app on your computer, at least at this point. There are some I know Mac apps. Um, that you can get like in the app store if you prefer to have an app version. Um, Mastonaut is one of those. That's one I've been experimenting with. I do not know all of these apps. I got these from another resource, <laughs> but you're welcome. These all, I'll share these slides. You're welcome to, um, actually, can you drop that link again that I shared with you, Robin, so people have these slides. Um, you're welcome to go explore these and see if there's one that you like. Um, thanks to Robin, I now know that there are some things that you can do on, on the website um, for your Mastodon instance that makes it, I think, the best way of um, just following activity. And I'm going to show you that in a second. All right. So the last thing I just want to talk about here before we open it up to any more questions and let people kind of explore and try stuff out is that Mast is to mention that Mastodon is not without criticism and critique. Um, and I think this is really, really important. And it kind of brings me back to where we started, which is that I know for myself that I am no longer comfortable just being on Twitter without looking around, without spending some time thinking about what's happening there and looking around at alternatives and thinking about my own presence online and how I want to manage it. I am not convinced that Mastodon is where I'm going to end up living. My primary online, you know, microblogging self, if that's something I even continue. Um, but I do think it's it's a system and a platform worth understanding and worth investigating. But let's talk about what's wrong with it. Um, the first is that it is not immune to mob mentality. Um, and in particular, this has been a problem, and I would say in the last month, because of the growing pains it's been experiencing with an influx, influx of new people when that happens, when you get that many people flooding this new system that they don't fully understand yet. Um, it's really easy for things to kind of get out of control. Um, and there have been some really kind of gross examples of people getting banned or blocked on Mastodon, particular people of color, um, uh, for no reason at all, just that things were badly managed. <laughs> um, and so that is a real problem. And some of that is Mastodon and some of that is just the nature of seeing people, millions of people who are on Twitter trying to find a new home and migrate to a new place that is somewhat the same, but really not. And everybody having to figure out exactly what that means. Um, this is, second one is probably the biggest one in, in some ways, which is that like all the community that you or, or we or other people have created on Twitter truly has been effectively erased. So there are things that you can do to, um, to, to, to find the people you followed on Twitter, to, um, 
to recreate or rebuild your community, but it, it's impossible that you're going to be able to do that fully or completely. And for some communities, that's really, really hard, um, particularly for marginalized communities who have struggled as it is to find space on Twitter, to get heard on Twitter, to create a safe space on Twitter, to have that pulled out from them and have to restart in a new place, in a new space with rules that sometimes work and sometimes don't work, um, it's not surprising that some of those communities have said they don't want to participate in Mastodon, that they don't feel like that's where they want to end up. This third one, also super important, basically Mastodon runs on the concept of volunteer moderation, on volunteer administration and moderation, right? So we all kind of like lots of people are have agreed that they don't want to play the Twitter game anymore and they're uncomfortable with the person at the top and the rules that that person is making. And it's easy then to say, well, we need the opposite, which is we want a system and a platform that doesn't have a person on top making rules instead that enables us and users and communities to make rules and to moderate and make decisions, which sounds kind of great. And in an ideal world, maybe would be, but the reality is that this is volunteer work um, and people get burnt out, people get overwhelmed. Um, and when that happens, it's really, really easy for them to end up taking the path of least resistance instead of the best path. So there are other stories that have been coming out about people getting banned from servers who did they didn't actually do anything wrong. They were falsely accused of having done something wrong. And the administrators, these volunteer administrators who are not getting paid for this are like, you know what? I don't have the bandwidth or the energy to deal with this. I just have to have you off my server because the drama it's creating is more than I can handle. Um, so, which is understandable, but also unfortunate because people get hurt in that process. And then the last thing here is that like, while we all have, may have strong feelings about Elon Musk, the reality is that Eugen Rochka, the um, creator of Mastodon, he has his own sort of problematic history. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, like he's the original creator. He's technically kind of the owner of the project. He's done some things that other developers and collaborators feel like are kind of bullying not letting other voices be heard about where the project could go or what it should do. He's a little bit kind of has this attitude of like, if you don't like it, you should leave or I'll take my toys and go home, um, as opposed to seeing this as an open source project with a large umbrella under which lots of different people can find um, leadership roles and position. Um, you know, in fairness, he's also got a really clear vision of what it is he wants. And he probably feels like opening it up, opening that umbrella up, opens it up to the potential for that vision to be abused or changed or pulled out from under him. So he's trying to exert control as a way to do that project that he set out to do. But in the process, some people have felt like they no longer want to be a part of that project. So I think that's it. I feel like I skipped over this slide though, I'm realizing. Did, did I talk about this? Finding people? I'm sorry, I don't know how I skipped over that. It just went by fast. So, cause as I was doing that last slide, I realized I had never talked about this. This is probably the single most important thing you have to do when you join Mastodons. You have to find people, right? Otherwise you're just talking to yourself in the void which some of us enjoy, but you know, that's not really why we're doing this. Um, who are moving from Twitter, our single biggest concern is how do we find our people? How do we find the people we followed on Twitter? There are some services that have started to emerge that will um, like connect to your Twitter account and then search Mastodon to try and find uh, the users, their user accounts on Mastodon, in particular because lots of people like me, for example, have changed my username on Twitter to include now my Mastodon username, which allows these services then to easily draw um, lines between people. One of them, the one I've tried is called Debirdify. I don't know Fetafinder, but it's another one that's been recommended to me. Um, once you find people, you can search for them in your Mastodon app or on your Mastodon instant, instance. When you find them, you click follow and you are now following them, unless they're on a server that's been banned by your instance, in which case you're not going to find them. <laughs> um, 
But it's important to know it's not enough to just know somebody's username, right? Their username, it's like an email address. You have to know the full name. You have to know their username and their instance. So for example, I'm mbertis on Twitter, but on Mastodon, I'm both mbertis at mastodon.social and mbertis at scholar.social. Presumably somebody else out there could be mbertis at something else dot something. Um, I don't own mbertis across Mastodon. I just own those two specific instances of it. The other way that you might end up following people is sometimes people are sharing their Mastodon profile page. So I could share my Mastodon.social profile page with all of you right now. It would take you to that page. You could click follow there, but from there, when you're on somebody's profile page, it's a little bit more cumbersome unless you're on the same server as them, which you can log into. Um, you have to copy and paste um, from that there's like a little pop-up that appears. You have to copy and paste their user URL into the search bar of your Mastodon app or your Mastodon website in order to follow and find them. So it's easier if you can find them from within your instance or on the app from within your instance. It's a little trickier if you're getting at it from their profile page, um, but it is doable. All right, that is the end of my presentation. I am going to stop sharing. And um, open it up to any other questions or comments. Um, I know there are other people in the room who are already using um, Mastodon. If you want to share anything that I didn't talk about, correct anything I got wrong, please do that. Um, or um, get into anything else, feel free to unmute and do that now. I'll just throw out there that um, it was, I, I've been enjoying Mastodon quite a bit. Um, you know, I was there so many years ago and wanted to love it, but it was just too hard because there weren't enough people. And so I do find now that it's much livelier and there are people and I'm getting good content. Um, the one thing I wish, the one thing I'm feeling like I'm lacking really struck me during the Georgia um, runoffs is that the news you know, the, there's a lot of really cool individuals on Mastodon, but we haven't quite gotten the orgs. So like um, there's some news agencies on there, which I'm excited to find, but like not most of them. And um, the same with organizations, like professional, whatever. So that's, that's one of the things I'm really, really hopeful about. And I think for me, will make or break it is like whether we get, you know, more of those, um, outlets kind of um, because I couldn't, like I like to follow like election data. I like to follow the, you know, journalists and newsrooms that are local to our, an area or whatever. And, you know, that I, I felt like it's, it's not working for breaking news the way that tw Twitter does. And Twitter for breaking news truly is like in some ways so democratizing because once you know something is going on, you if you're good at Twitter, you can search it in such a way that you can end up following local nobodies, but the people who like really know what's going on. And um, I, I just miss that kind of, um, you know, that just comes from the numbers and it comes from local people in conversation with verified significant agencies, you know? And like, um, so I still think there's some ways where, you know, it just isn't going to, like it's one reason why I'm just not gonna get off Twitter for a good long time, assuming it doesn't fully implode in a week, which it absolutely might, um, is because, you know, there still are some things happening there that are really hard to replicate anywhere anywhere else um right now so but for the most part i'm i'm really pretty encouraged by it i'm i'm liking it i like the moderation i feel like my instance has actual values that i can identify with you know that's refreshing so i don't know I'm just blabbing but for the most part i i've enjoyed it over there anyone else yeah i i definitely um I'm curious to see where we are with this in like a year. Um, I would say that it's a little bit 
one of the biggest critiques that I did not talk about, and this was kind of on purpose, um, but one of the biggest critiques of Mastodon is people feel that like technically it's really complicated. Um, and in a way, like, you know, I just went through a fair amount of information. There's some pretty significant nuance to a lot of that. But the reality is that like Robin and I were talking about this earlier, if I was to do like a presentation about Twitter for people who've never been on Twitter before, it could fe feel equally as sort of bizarre and complicated. The reason why this feels the way it does is because it's not Twitter and we're used to Twitter. The, but when Twitter first started, none of us were used to that either. So um, I think some of this is about if people want to make a go of it, you do have to kind of let that concern about the compl complexity, like, like leave that at the door a little bit until you've um, dug into it and really un learned some of the nuances and how things work. And you might discover then that, oh, this isn't really so much more complex. It's just complex in different ways than Twitter was. And it, it's, a, it's a literacy that we have to build. Um, but There's I also- so many there's also so many people not on Twitter, yeah. like, yes. you know, not on Twitter. Like, if you go yeah. on Twitter, they're all on Twitter. But, yeah. like, if we talk about our colleagues, say, at Plymouth State, or you talk about your students, or you talk about people in your professional field, most people are not on Twitter. Yeah. So I think what would be really interesting is to think more about how we talk about this with the people who aren't on Twitter at all. Yep. The, you know... Like, because federation, I think, makes a lot more sense in terms of social media than a centralized model makes. Um, so if you haven't been completely schooled in the centralized model, it might make a lot of sense to people for the, you know, to think about this this way. I don't know. Yeah, I... um. One somebody I was reading one thing while I was putting together these slides from somebody who was saying, like, is it possible that like the death of Twitter really becomes the death of this concept of microblogging? Like, and it you know, I would say that like that to me is is the piece of this that I find most concerning, not because I'm so beholden to microblogging, but because you know, the idea that we let a single company become the the owner of a practice to such a large extent that we can't even imagine at scale doing it in any other way or in any other place. Um, I think that's a real problem with tech, the way that we think about technology these days and the way that we associate our practices as being beholden to companies or corporations or um, you know, particular commercial systems that we've signed up with. And you know, another critique of 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 moving to Mastodon that I've heard from my friend Kin Lane is that, you know, Twitter has at this point, whether we like it or not, whether we realized it or not, become almost akin to a public utility. Um, you know, municipalities re rely on it for to share public safety information to, to share public health information during covid it became a source sometimes unfortunately of quote unquote health information but also of legitimate scientific public health information when at the point when a service provided by a, a commercial company has become that ingrained in um, sort of the information infrastructure of our society, like what does it mean that a change of ownership can completely and so quickly bring it to its knees? Like to to me, like I'm not sure, frankly, as much as I I understand what Ken is saying and I understand why he feels like it's important to take a stand. I feel like we've lost our chance with that with Twitter. I think what we need to do is learn our lesson now going forward that like we can't do that. We can't continue to do that. We can't continue to use these systems in ma on mass in the ways that we are and rely on them so greatly and then be at the mercy of the market <laughs> um, in ways that have really deep repercussions for us and our communities. Even acknowledging, as you say, Robin, lots of people aren't on Twitter, but for those people who are on Twitter, for some of them, literally it's their livelihood too. So like, 
you know, I think we need to think a little bit differently about all of this. And I get concerned that our conversation about moving or what we're doing focuses mostly on our personal needs. Like, what do I need? What does Robin need? What does Matt need? What does the collab need? Like, as opposed to like culturally, what do we need? How do we need to educate ourselves and rethink this stuff and talk about this stuff? Because if we're not having that conversation on that higher level, we're just going to keep doing this over and over and over again. Well, yeah, and you can look at Twitter going from, you know, Jack or whatever the hell his name yeah. was to Elon. <laughs> like, it's it's not really helpful just to find a nicer Jack or no. a nicer Elon. Like, Jack was okay, you know, I mean, it was horrible, but he's okay. But he sold it to Elon, you know what I mean? Like, so no. if you're going to be in a capitalist model for controlling your communication platform you know it, it's just not going to be enough to find a corporation or individual that you trust like somehow i think we've got to get out of that model it's it's why this is my 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 best hope i yeah i don't know yeah anyway, and I, I, it's I, kind I, of I a lot of things from this and i thought i knew what i was doing but i didn't <laughs> I, I will just say as like a kind of follow up and teaser to what Robin just said, as I've been doing the research, getting looking at Mastodon, thinking about my own next steps, one of the things that I've kept coming back to and that I'm now pretty committed to rethinking or thinking about more <laughs> is the way in which we, my own personal presence and identity online needs to be centered in and at my own domain as opposed to at my Twitter profile or my Facebook profile, or my LinkedIn or my Instagram, whatever, you know, whichever platform you love the most. Not that I think I can stop using those or want to stop using those, but I'm really been thinking about from a technical standpoint, what would it mean for all of my content to originate at my domain and then get pushed out from there to these other spaces and places so that if one of them disappears, I maintain my community, I maintain my content, I maintain my network. Um, and I can at any point essentially defederate from any of them, right? I can say, I'm, I'm done working in that space. I'm gonna switch to another space and I haven't lost anything in the way that I might have. So we're talking about doing maybe some programming in the spring, um, getting back to Domain of One's Own and Plymouth Create and, and what role that plays in this conversation as well. I know we've got a couple of people on Zoom. I don't know if Kristen or John or Alyssa have any questions or um, comments or thoughts they wanna share. No, uh, thank you for the presentation. I was only playing with Mastodon a few times over the weekend and had not really, it's like, huh, this is actually kind of looks interesting. The, the explanation was really good. I'm glad it was helpful. Let us know if there's anything else we can, you know, help with as you, as you learn more, John. Yeah, have you heard of anybody um, doing any um, interesting sort of class projects or in terms not yet. of yeah. collaboration? Not yet, but I would love to, um, mm -hmm. To start doing a little bit of talking about that and research about that because you know that's my <laughs> that's definitely in my in my um portfolio thinking about that so if you ever want to chat about it let me know okay that's it it's kind of I've, you know, it's been done with twitter it's been done with uh yeah. Snapchat, so this is another it's a yep. another tool for collaboration yep and i'm always in favor of using these tools too as a way to have conversations with our students about all of these issues because frankly like a lot of them don't get a chance to think about or talk about these things and i think it is really really important for us to be doing that so. mm -hmm. yep Agreed. kristen i'm glad that was helpful too kristen i saw your message in chat and if that unless there's any other questions or comments i'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now